So Joel Gottlieb joined D-Wave in January 2016 as a senior pre-sales analyst after 20 years at AT&T and AT&T Research. He earned a PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in condensed matter physics after graduating from the University of Michigan. At D-Wave, his role includes bringing new users to the quantum computer and researching basic problems which show the power of the system. He loves learning new subjects and new technology, and I must say he loves teaching it as well, uh, and also enjoys talking music. So with that, um, Joel, go ahead and get started. Thank you, Susan, um, as always. So today we're gonna talk about getting started with quantum. And basically my goal for the next uh, half hour or so is to tell you about some practical applications that people have already written for the D-Wave system. And then we'll go through a little bit of quantum computing and D-Wave and LEAP and the Ocean SDK. If you don't know what those things are right now, you will by the end, I promise. And we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with uh, how you can get started today, signing up and, and getting yourself going with this, uh, in this new exciting field of, uh, of quantum computing. We call this practical quantum computing, and these are gonna be practical applications because what's already happened is that people have been working on our system for several years now, and we already have more than 250 uh, applications which have been written. And they, they're they all over the map in terms of the fields and the subjects and things like that. And it's kind of a counter to what's out there in the press sometimes that it's too soon for quantum computing to be practical. And, and we don't believe that. We, we've been seeing this happen. The day is coming very soon when people will be running production applications on the quantum computer. And I'm gonna start out with a couple examples in the life sciences field. Uh, and I should mention at the outset that more detail on all of these topics is available at dwavesys.com. I will also uh, provide links as we go, uh, but there's lots and lots of documentation and even a search uh, application built by Susan that uh, can show you uh, and with uh, searchable boxes to pick applications in whatever field you're interested in. And I'm gonna hone in on the general field here of drug discovery. And so the first company application I'll talk about is a company called Menton AI from Canada. And the links are provided here if you're interested, a first a case study document and then the, uh, the bio archive paper describing this. But basically what Menton did is what we call quantum powered protein design. What does that mean? The idea is that if you could design proteins, for example, to target in cancer research, a very specific protein that would attack tumors in a very specific way, or even more like in industrial processes, as we get closer and closer to biotech and nanotech, these new fields where molecules may be used to generate things, you want your proteins to have specific and very specific properties so that they don't harm other cells. So you can think of these as targeted things, but the issue is that in this field of computational protein design, it was, a, it was a trial and error and computationally intensive process. And the field that Menton is in is called the Rotomer optimization problem, if you're interested. But what Menton did is there was a tool out there called Rosetta, which was used for protein design. And you, uh, you, you, know, you could use it to design molecules and also test their mathematical properties. And, and what, what Menton did was to modify it, basically add some functionality to make their own version, which they called QPacker. Packer is the name of uh, Rosetta's package to do it. Um, they did an initial experiment 
that led to a quantum designed molecule. So this was good. And then they went on and they found better solutions and better time to solution versus the Rosetta package. And so I just like this picture. This was in their paper. And the, uh, in the yellow, or you might see it as, as sort of a green color, is the Rosetta Packer algorithm. And the lower you can get is the better in, in lowering the energy. And there does, their data definitely does show better solutions and shorter times. And so basically, this was a success for Menton. And what they then did, so this is a couple of years ago, is of course COVID-19 happened. And the big thing then became how can we help using this protein design technology that we have? How can we help this field? And D-Wave actually offered some free time uh, to people who wanted to contribute. And there were projects involved in that. There's some data on the D-Wave site, but what I want to mention is a notion of uh, quantum peptide therapeutics. And once again, that's a very fancy phrase. And I'm going to um, mention what it is in a way that hopefully you'll be able to understand. Um, basically, the, the COVID-19, this is a very dense slide, and I'll come back to it in a second. But basically, the COVID-19 molecule has some proteins on it that are kind of spikes. They stick out, they're protrusions, if you like. And this has happened before. It, it's the case for just about all of the uh, infective agents that like the HIV virus did, did something much the same. Those, those spikes have sort of a switch on them that, that either is on or off. And if it's on, this molecule the COVID-19 virus has the ability to latch on to our cells and it inject its genetic material and mess everything up and make us sick. So what we really want to do is design a molecule known as a peptide, a small chain of amino acids, design it so that it can somehow attach to these uh, COVID-19 virus molecules and turn off those switches so that they can't attach to our cells and basically nullify the effect of the virus. And so what Menton did is that, uh, oops, I did not mean to do that, sorry. Menton created a fixed backbone. This is toward the bottom of the slide. And basically using the D-Wave quantum computer system, designed the peptide in a way that it should bind as well as possible, efficiently, bind closely, bind specifically, so that it attaches to the virus but doesn't attach to anything else, doesn't make us sick, doesn't harm the body in any other way. And so using the D-Wave hybrid solver, they produce several peptide designs. And as far as I know, last I've heard, they've computationally checked them they've synthesized them and they're in testing. So this is pretty cool on live virus. Now, of course the vaccine is out already. So perhaps this will be more down the road because as we all know, the vaccine isn't going to make everything go away. It's only gonna help for the meantime. Okay, now I wanna mention a next application in the subject of cancer research. And this was a paper that appeared last year uh, from Jane et al. And there's the link for it. And what they did is quantum and classical machine learning for the classification of non-small cell lung cancer patients. What does this mean in layman's terms? It means that when someone appears with lung cancer or, or suspected cancer, you have to classify the cancer as carefully as you can because then you wanna put the patient on the best chemotherapy possible because chemotherapies, as we all know, do other harm and, and you don't want them on something that isn't going to work. So this particular effort was to classify between two subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell car carcinoma. And they used a combination 
of classical and quantum machine learning models to classify the patients using three feature selection methods. If you're not familiar with feature selection, it's kind of cool. You try to do this so you can reduce the number of variables in the problem, and you can focus on the ones that are most germane for making the classification that you want. In other words, the things that really do determine whether or not the tumor is of one type or the other. And Jane et al. came up with a representation model that they called Q-Crush, where you attempt in as minimal variables as possible to pack as much information in there as you can. And they mentioned also that the machine learning was performed by a quantum Boltzmann machine, which uh, is geek talk for a technique that's getting a lot of attention the last couple of years in, in machine learning. So here we have a important and coming up the scale application of machine learning right on the D-Wave system. Now, another set of things that were done was in the area of manufacturing or process optimization. And I'll talk about a couple of those examples. One from Denso in Japan, there's a paper. And it's a, it's a nice mouthful. This, I like to mention this topic because it's control of automated guided vehicles without collision by quantum annealer di digital devices. And Ozeki-san there, the first author, is quite a name in this field. He's a professor and also involved with a company and has written many papers that you can look up. But what does this mean? AGVs, these little vehicles, you sometimes see them in commercials in an Amazon, in this case, Denso uh, workplace. They are portable robots that, that you use to perhaps do some of the work that might be dangerous for people or, or very, very automated work. And they move along the floors, either using markers or wires or magnetism or some way that you have lasers, some way that you have to try to keep them from, from running into each other. But in limited size warehouses, you have a problem, which is that, can you picture the traffic jams that would occur if all these robots ended up at an intersection at the same time and, and there's no driver to get out of it? as if people could get out of them anyway, but that's not the point. The point is that you have to have live traffic information quickly, and you have to have some way to process that information to solve the jams. And another example of that is, you also don't want machines sitting there for half an hour waiting for a jam to clear, because these machines don't get tired. They're supposed to work the whole time. So Denso formulated the problem as a cubo, I'll talk about Cubos coming up. And they, uh, this was sort of a starting effort. They worked on a smaller problem. And I'm hoping to see Denso updating its results for um, the uh, Advantage system, which I'm going to mention to you shortly, and also the hybrid solver. And another good example is GE. This is work from a couple years ago. Uh, there's the link to it. And uh, they call it uh, supply chain asset sustainment. And what this means is that in a warehouse, you, uh, you have lots of parts and machines that have to be repaired and replaced. And they told me it is fast. This warehouse is of a big size. And so stuff is basically breaking constantly. And you can't have the warehouse stuck waiting for a team to show up and fix a particular machine. So to illustrate the scale of what they're facing, I thought this was interesting in the middle of this page here, three repairs in a warehouse is small farm, 10 repairs might be a corner garage down the street that, that you see the cars parked in the street and they're swapping them in and out. 30 repairs would be a dealer dealing with maybe, you know, when you wait there for your vehicle, but 300 repairs is the GE problem, and it's huge. 92 repair sequences, 230 resources. They formulated this as a Cubo, and what they found is that Advantage, which I'll talk about coming up, is doing better than our previous model, the 2000Q, and the recent work is focusing on the hybrid solver, and they are doing very well with this. They have seen 
some good optimization from the computer. And finally, one more example is uh, paint shop optimization that was done at Volkswagen in Europe. And please do watch this YouTube video here. Our, our former colleague, Shiri Arconi, gives the presentation. He, uh, he moved over to, to VW a few years ago and is, is still happily there. And basically the work that was done on this is that it came after their work. If you heard of the quantum shuttle at Lisbon, there's the paper where they, people were routed back and forth between a hotel and a conference site using the quantum computer. But I thought this was an interesting problem. The, um, the cars are coming in the warehouse and you're swapping colors. You basically have to do an undercoat of white or black. If the first one of this model comes in white, then the next one's gonna be black. And the problem you have to solve is changing colors costs money for the little paint apparati that are next to the cars. If you keep switching between white and black and back and forth constantly, Sheer explained that you, not only does that cost just to make the switch and somebody has to be involved, but the waste paint. Paint's basically being thrown out because you're switching the nozzles and all that. And their results were excellent so far that, that they've been getting. And I'm guessing this will be one of the early ones to go into production when they're ready. Okay, so the first part of the talk was to motivate you to get involved by some of the practical computing things. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about us and I wanna give a shout out to our other videos that are on YouTube, there are many. Um, please look up some of these concepts if this goes a little fast. But what is quantum computing? In a nutshell, and not doing much introduction to it at all, instead of having bits, which are either ones or zeros, in this case, you have something called a qubit, which is quantum bit became shortened to qubit. It, when you measure it at the end, it's either zero, one, Schrodinger's cat is either alive or dead, if you're familiar with that reference. But in between, before you measure it, it can have states of a huge number of combinations of the zero and the one. And computationally, it was shown that if you could somehow do this, if you could set up a computer that could utilize the quantum properties, you could get something that would be so much more powerful and faster in the long run. And so basically, welcome to D-Wave. D-Wave was founded in 1999 in Vancouver. And a picture is on the right of our most recent Advantage QPU. If you're wondering how big that is, it's about 12 feet on a side. It's a cube. And uh, just picture a big fridge. It kind of sits there. It's got a dilution refrigerator inside and it kind of makes a whooshing noise when it runs every second or so. We have some major customers. They're listed there, as I mentioned earlier, 200, more than 250 uh, early applications and some national laboratories and Denso, some other companies. And Ad Advantage was announced. Uh, it's going on about three, four months ago now in the fall. Um, it, it has uh, much higher connectivity between the qubits more than 5,000 qubits. And um, you can read this uh, when, when you're done or, or look on the web about it. But so far, the customers have been very happy with its performance improvement over the 2000 Q. But just briefly, what goes on inside that box is the, uh, the processor is at the bottom of that inverted stack. And, um, the stack sits inside this dilution refrigerator. And just some of the numbers there on the left doesn't use a whole lot of power. The various, the various layers correspond to different temperatures as the superconducting refrigerator does its thing so that all the way at the bottom, it's in the environment it needs to be. And so the quantum properties of matter can be taken into account. And all other computer uh, quantum computer vendors right now, IBM, Google, IonQ, well, not IonQ, but all the others have a picture that looks like this uh, somewhere in their setup. They, you have to, 
right now, this is how this is done. So basically there's tons of wiring between that chip where it is and the rest of the machine. And you got to isolate it from radio frequency. You got to isolate it temperature wise because if it warms up too much, it doesn't superconduct. It's not quantum anymore. Bad things happen. So you have to keep it in this environment. Now, there were a couple choices when D-Wave was deciding to get into the space about 15 years ago. There were, was going to someday be gate model quantum computers like, like uh, IBM and Google have been building and Rigetti. And there was the notion had come up of quantum annealing from a paper and actually more than one paper, they're, they're all here, written uh, by Nishimori-san, the second author, in 1998 said, you know, you could build one of these things if you managed to build it in this particular way. It was the beginning of the discussion, but D-Wave actually accomplished it. And I'll get to that in a second. But basically the image I wanna have in your head is that you're going to parameterize this problem by expressing your problem, whatever it is, as a model with variables that represent the qubits, the Qs, and you have some numbers, A's and B's, where you can adjust them and try to make it so that the lowest energy state represents the best energy, the best solution to the problem. So an example would be the traveling salesman, the, the, the Amazon truck that drives all over the city. You want that truck to be on the minimal energy path to waste the least gas and going around the city, for example. And so classical algorithms kind of don't have the options that the quantum does where the quantum can tunnel through the, through the barriers. And so the, the problem gets formulated as what is called an objective function. You write an energy and this isn't as hard as I'm making it sound. <laughs> it's, we have a very good training course where we go over how to do this, but that's a different topic. But you find solutions where you're looking for that lowest energy and you're looking for, uh, sometimes you want the absolute lowest, sometimes it's good enough, like to use that example of that, uh, that Amazon truck, off a couple minutes isn't gonna hurt anything. Off an hour is a much bigger deal. So you wanna get as close to the lowest energy as you can. D-Wave's goal going back to 2007 was build a machine like this as a programmable grid of these qubits, set it up as a programmable machine where the qubits can be set by setting those A's and B's, got to work at millikelvin temperature. It's got to represent easing model problems or cubo, as I mentioned earlier. And um, you're going to use voltages in, in the little qubits to, to control them. And my favorite one is the bottom one each problem has to be independent of the one before. So obviously if somebody uses the machine and puts a particular problem on it, you must erase it well enough so that that problem isn't there anymore when the next problem comes along. And D-Wave has been able to do that incredibly well over the last uh, now 14 years. So the way it was architected was in a unit cell where you basically set up a, a structure of these qubits and uh, all the stuff on the left there I've mentioned now, but picture these colors as wires and, and the wires where they interact are couplers and you, you set these constants on the couplers. This picture is of the advantage unit cell, which is known as Pegasus, the, uh, the new architecture. And here's the programming model if there are physicists out there, this is the famous easing model um, with a couple of constants different, but you set these A's and B's and the Q's are, uh, are sampled by the quantum computer and then it returns one or zero in all the Q's. The machine figures out what the lowest energy it thinks it is, sends you back the Q's, you write some software to look at the values and interpret them. And uh, so the best way to think of it is we're gonna write this minimization function, which is composed of two things. One is constraints 
and the other is an objective function. So in the case of the traveling salesman, the objective is the minimum mileage. I wanna minimize how, how much it would cost. So if you think of it in terms of the US, for example, you wouldn't wanna drive all the way from New York to California and then back to New Jersey. Obviously a regular path, a, a, the solution would be some kind of loop. And that's just one you can picture in your head. And then the constraints are mathematical things that tell you how many times you're allowed to do something, you know, as one example. So with a traveling salesman, you only wanna go into a city once and come out of it once. And that's a constraint. Now, just briefly here, I'm showing you what a Cubo looks like on the bottom or an easing model. It's got X's and Y's and uh, W's. These are the variables in it, which, which you have set up. And in this case, this one has two lowest energies. It doesn't matter what this is. It was mostly just to show it to you. So how do you get started? Because I want you to. <laughs> we, Advantage is coupled with our, our cloud platform, which is called Leap, as in take a leap into the system. And the idea is that Leap was designed to allow cloud access so that you could immediately start writing programs in Python to access it. And here's a way to see it, that the machine's over there on the left and you're on the right and you send jobs through the cloud and the API, or in this case, the Ocean SDK, takes care of the underneath plumbing so that you don't have to know how to talk directly to the quantum computer. And then the results come back. So it's picture it going across to the left and then back the other way to the end. And here's an, uh, a brief summary of the architecture of the Ocean SDK at the bottom. If you remember the old internet models 20 years ago, you put the hardware on the bottom and then you start writing things that abstract the hardware away, like the samplers they're called. Then you start getting up into generalized problems like graph mapping, constraint compilation, until you get up to the top where you have scheduling and finding faults in a circuit and uh, VW's example, of traffic flow or Denso's example of keeping those warehouses, uh, keeping those robots out of each other's way. We've also released a Leap IDE for those of you that are happiest uh, when you're programming in a, uh, an integrated developer environment, I'm too old, but for those who like it, <laughs> a Leap IDE takes care of all the, the downloads and all the annoying things you have to do to get started and, and you can, start writing programs in it right away. And I also wanna give a quick mention of our hybrid solver service. The idea here is to build a solver that can handle bigger problems by using the QPU as the back end, where the problem comes in, the classical part works on it, sends the part that it knows the quantum is gonna be good at, the quantum sends back an answer and it continues until it finds the best answer. And this is very easy to use. Uh, it's only got one parameter and I encourage you to try it. So to sum up, um, D-Wave's approach is quantum annealing and it's practical and it's already here. And the programming is gonna involve writing these cubos and, and easing models. Um, the SDK makes it easier, it, you do it in Python. And what I'm hoping, is that I have motivated you with this to get involved. And the link on the bottom there, if you haven't done it, sign up for it so that you can get one minute free per the first month. And then if you provide a GitHub ID, you get one minute free in subsequent months. And you're probably sitting there laughing like one minute, that's not a lot, except it is. Most problems run in milliseconds because that, that annealing cycle is very fast. So you can do quite a bit with this minute. And uh, I encourage you to do that. And finally, just to finish up, um, we are hiring. So please take a look at our, our careers page. Uh, with COVID-19, it's been a, I know it's been a tough year for internships. So, so please have a look. 
in any case, uh, this has been Getting Started with Quantum. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Joel. We've had a lot of questions come in uh, during the talk and we have a lot more. So what I'm going to do is I'll be asking them out loud, but I'm going to take our, some of our expert panelists, Alex, David, and Tanvi, and I will take them off mute so that they can weigh in as well on these questions. Yay. So let's start at the top here. Um, and whoever wants to answer it, um, please jump in. Just out of interest, how green is quantum computing? How much energy does it use? How much heat does it generate? Boiling away liquid nitrogen if D-Wave needs to be cold. I'll get that, I guess. Um, it's very green. The, the, um, it doesn't require much power at all to run that machine. Um, I, I think on our website, there's still some examples, but it, it's, it's very, uh, very, very low energy because the QPU itself only really needs energy when it's, when it's doing something. The, the box itself, these, these, um, these refrigerators are very efficient. And what it does need is liquid nitrogen a couple times a week and um, cold water to, to work in the, in the um, in the uh, refrigerator, but but that's really it. I think in the long run, it's gonna compete really well because the HP systems, HPC systems take up entire rooms and need their own power grids. Right, and also just to make the point that we're providing these systems as we expect most quantum computers will be available over the cloud. So, um, you know, we're not expecting that there's gonna be too many of these installed in large data centers in any case. Um, next question, in how many of these examples is there proven evidence of significant quantum advantage or even the inability to deliver using classical computers? That, of course, is a great question. So one of our panelists want to weigh in. Okay, Joel. Yeah, Joel I think oh, Alex? Is... Yep. <laughs> no, I'm, I was just saying, Joel, I think this one's best suited okay. for Okay, but the truth is none at this point. Um, the, the real, we, we uh, as D-Wave, um, we have felt for a while that looking for advantage, it's a little premature to, because the problems that people have submitted like Google's big announcement, and then I think there was a Chinese one earlier this year, those tend to be very contrived problems that are set up just specifically to do this very not real world thing. And so led by our CEO, Alan Barrett's, our direction has been, no, we don't wanna compete for proving necessarily right now that we're better. We wanna show that we can do practical things and let's let that evolve. I expect over the next few years, it's gonna get very competitive, but for right now, I would not claim that we can show that. Okay, next question. What is the maximum size of the Cubo problem you solved with the D-Wave solver and how long did it take you to get the result? Our panelists are shy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so oh, go ahead. Sorry, was that question specific to one of Joel's examples or is it more general, do you think? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I was taking it more generally. generally. More generally. Uh, so working directly with the QPU um, with advantage, you can solve um, a dense problem of up to 180 fully connected nodes. And then if you're looking at um, our hybrid solvers, so the HSS BQM, that's the binary quadratic model solver, I believe we can solve problems with up to 2,000 variables, or sorry, 20,000 variables on that one. And then if you're looking at the hybrid DQM solver, so that's the discrete quadratic model solver, um, that works with up, with variables of up to 5,000. Um, yeah, so we can get, when we um, start to use hybrid solvers, we can um, solve much larger problems. And how would somebody know what the best approach is for their particular problem? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I would say, um, I hope I'm not taking all these, but it, you, you want to try 
what I usually suggest is try the QPU first and maybe the problem is too big for that. And you, you usually find out, try the hybrid solvers, but also try, uh, we have some solvers which don't cost time to use like simulated annealing and, and a taboo solver that's all included with your ocean uh, installation. I would say to try those and the hybrid solvers first. And, and what I have found is you run the problem a few times if the same answer starts popping up, you think you got something good. You know, I'm, I guess I'm sort of approaching this kind of experimentally, but I think at this early stage, that's okay. Okay, question. Uh, hello everyone, do you offer a complete training in quantum computing? Okay, I can take that one because Victoria is muted. Yes, there is a week long training course. Um, there's an open course coming up in April. So if you're interested in taking training from D-Wave, please reach out to sales at dwavesys.com. Um, I've taken it and it was really great. It was super helpful. I learned a lot. Um, yeah, so I highly recommend it. And it's really focused on helping developers get started and uh, going through a lot of the tools that we have and kind of learning how to solve problems. Uh, question, what is the difference between quantum annealing and quantum adiabatic processes? <laughs> Good one for you. Yeah, so it, the word adiabatic uh, generally is supposed to mean no energy from the outside. Um, I think that we used to call it quantum adiabatic optimization and, and we've gone away from that, but I'm not exactly sure why. I, I'm using them in my slides more or less synonymous. So I'm not really answering the question. Uh, what is the correct approach in learning quantum computing as a physics background necessary? And okay, I think we, we have can go. Yeah. Um, a physics background is not necessary. We're trying to make um, learning about quantum computing and how to use our systems as easy as possible. So uh, we've designed Ocean or SDK so that there are multiple entry points. If you do have a physics background and if you're interested in interacting directly with the QPU, you're able to do that. But if you have more of a computer science background or some other type of background, um, we have lots of documentation and lots of resources to get you started and to help you learn how to use our systems without needing to know exactly how they work. To so. add, yeah, to add to what Alex said, I would add that it's not at all the physics or even a computer science degree. It's can you pick up these topics? Like there, a lot of it comes out of math and some computer concepts, just learning. I've met people from all kinds of different fields that have picked up this material fairly fast. It's, you know, mostly just dealing with things that you don't know about. You have to look them up and figure them out. Okay. Uh, do you provide access to resources like in a cloud to a small farm, firm like ours having three developers? How does the security work in this situation? So I guess either Alex or Joel can talk about Leap. Yeah, we we don't. Um, the the basically the the in terms of security, it's it's um, we don't have any way like if, if it was a national laboratory or something where you, where you had to control the data all the way through the whole part of it, then that's a little that we don't have that ability. Right now, it's basically like secure shell type of security throughout the the um, the ocean process. Okay. I don't know if that really, yeah, the partial answer. A uh, note to some of our panelists: you can continue to uh, answer some of these questions over text because there's more than we're going to have time for. Alex, were you going to add something? Oh yeah, I was just going to add that. Um, for a small firm, like with three developers, a really good way to kind of get started and, and try out our system is to sign up for Leap. Uh, when you sign up, you'll get one free minute of QPU time, which translates to 20 free minutes of um, HSS solver time or hybrid solver time. So that would be a good, good way to um, like try things out. You can run some code examples and just see if our platform um, is maybe in line with what you're looking for. 
Okay, uh, having a problem understanding how to use interference to eliminate non-optimal entangled qubits. Okay. Um, so that question goes more toward the gate model architectures. In, in the D-Wave system, the entanglement is there, but we don't really have control over it. Like there's not a knob that you can set up. Whereas in the gate model, you set up the qubits and you specifically do a entanglement experiment by setting up the wave functions using the particular gates. That is not how this works. So I think that question really is more of a, um, a gate model question. It's just, we, we mention interference, we mention entanglement, but they're, they're not something that we can control because okay. our, our, our approach is different. Uh, his question, we use quantum computing for solving probabilistic problems rather than deterministic problem. Are there any thoughts on use cases in telecommunications? Anyone else? I would say on that, um, there will be not so far. So first of all, please go to dwavesys.com and look at the applications and just put in telecommunications. I know that some routing problems have been solved. And um, I know that people have been looking into things like that. So I would guess that in terms of network optimization or, or traffic optimization, traffic routing, things like that, 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 that you will find some papers written. I'm not too familiar with some of them, but um, I, I, I uh, ah, and someone just, thank you. Someone just mentioned a, there's an antenna problem that's, that's on there. Uh, and I should mention this, that um, uh, the dwavesys.com site also has some code examples, maybe 25 of them. Um, actually some composed by my, our very own panelists right here. <laughs> um, and uh, those give an example of how an application actually works. One that I really like recently is a, uh, how do you place electric chargers for cars in a city grid? My colleague Victoria just worked on this and it's, please look for that one, it's really cool. It makes you think in two dimensions. Okay, we have time for just a couple more. What about non-quadratic, non-combinatorial optimization? So in that case, you try to reduce it to a quadratic. There's some mathematical techniques uh, for getting it down. We also, Ocean has some what are called cubo or higher order binary optimization uh, classes that you could explore. Right now, if they go too far afield and the model just doesn't uh, fit, then we can't do a whole lot about it right now, I would say. Um, you know, for example, a, a continuous variable problem like the shape of an airplane wing, that's a little bit off into the future. There's just a lot of variables and we don't do continuous variables at this point. Okay, well, we, are I think at the end of our time here. There are a lot of questions that haven't been answered, but we will uh, go through them um, over the course of the next couple of days and send back answers to those that uh, ask them. Um, just as a reminder, this is being recorded and will be available on the D-Wave YouTube site. As I said, there's also all of the webinars that we've been doing over the last couple of years are there as well. So there's a lot of information about how to get started uh, with LEAP and with the ocean tools and with programming. Um, again, if you're looking for kind of specific application examples, go to the D-Wave website and look under applications. Um, uh, we also will be sending out an email in a couple of days. A lot of people have asked for links to uh, some of the papers and content that Joel mentioned. So we'll put links in there so you can access it easily. And we'll also upload these slides so that you can have access to them as well. So thank you all very much for attending. We hope you found it worthwhile. Uh, we're always interested in your suggestions for future topics as well. So you can send that to sales at dwavesys.com and uh, we really appreciate it.
Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, our panelists.